dancing into joy so we can praise you. We can, we can worship you. Let's worship the Lord in this place. Let's praise him. He is good and his mercy is endured forever. You have torn you have turned the morning into dancing. Father God, we can rejoice, rejoice in your presence. We thank you, O oh God. There is no one like you. Let's lift up our hands and worship him. Praise him, for there is no one like him. No one like him. No one like Jesus. We praise your holy name. We praise you, Father. No one like you. Receive all the praise. You are great and great to be praised. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for joy. We thank you, God, for deliverance. We thank you for freedom. We thank you, God, because you are a faithful God. We thank you, God, because you are not a man that you should lie, not a man that you should repent. Father God, we thank you, God, because your promises are sure. They are yes and amen. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father God, for you have a faithful God. You are faithful. We can stand on your promises because they are sure. They are a sure foundation. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this morning that we are alive. We are in sound mind. Oh, Father God, we came into your presence. Father God, we say thank you, oh God, for health, oh Father. We thank you, oh Father God, that we can see. We say thank you, Father God. You are great and great to be praised. Hallelujah. Receive all the praise this morning. Receive all the glory this morning. Hallelujah. May you be enthroned in our praises this morning. Let's give a shout of praise to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. 
another one. I am free. Yeah. I am free. I am free. Hell loves another one. I am free. Yeah. I am free. I am free. Hell loves another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell loves another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Because you pick me up. Turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. I thank God. Oh, I thank God. Oh, I thank God. Respect to a person, he's no respect to a person. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Because you pick me up. You turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I'm the master. I'm the savior. Because you heal my mind, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because, because you heal my heart, you change my mind, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Hallelujah. How many free people do we have in this place? Father God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your freedom, oh God. Thank you for Jesus. We worship you, God. We worship you. So let's sing again. Get up, get up, get up. Get up on the grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up on the grave. Okay. Get up, get up, get up. Get up by the grave. Okay, get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up by the grave. Because you pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because, because you pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Hallelujah, let's worship, let's give him praise. We are free people. Hallelujah, thank you Jesus for purchasing our freedom. Oh, we worship you, Father. Oh, thank you for the freedom. Thank you that we've been ransomed by the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you for your freedom, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God, for your freedom that we are called children of God. Oh, Father God, we thank you. We praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we worship you, Father God. Let's continue to praise the Lord in this place, Father God. Hallelujah.
Shene. We praise you, Father God. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Father God, thank you, God. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
forevermore hallelujah hallelujah we are no longer slave to fear amen we need to say that so much that it becomes a reality in us amen that we don't have to be slave to fear it doesn't belong to us God didn't give it to us amen we don't have to be slave to fear yes he tries to grip all of us but we don't have to amen because the Bible says that Christ has delivered us from all fear Amen. Because it says, perfect love cast out fear. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't have to be slave to it. We don't have to be slave to fear and anxiety. Amen. It's not, it's not from God. And God didn't give it to us. Because you know what? Fear has torment with it. Fear has, it, it has punishment with it. It doesn't make you feel good. That's why we don't have to be slave to fear. Amen. Because perfect love cast out all fear. Amen. Hallelujah. So we thank God for what he has done in our life and what he's going to do again. Amen. So Father, we love you. We glorify your name this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We no longer slave to fear. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated for a moment. Praise God forevermore. Good morning to everyone. Hallelujah. It's good to see you all. Amen. Yeah. It's good. Thank you for showing up at church and those watching online. We welcome you as well. We thank you for joining us. Amen. Good to come to church. The Bible says not to forsake our assembling together. When we come together, we see one another. You see a smile, you know, what you've gone through during the week. It kind of fades out. Amen. It disappears. Amen. So it's good to come together. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, uh, Nugget is in Psalm 27, uh, verse 1. And I'm going to read it to you from the Good News Translation. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I will fear no one. Amen. The Lord protects me from all danger. I will not be afraid. Amen. Amen. If God is our light and salvation, fear can no longer dominate us. Because it's fear, it's not from God. It's from the devil. Amen. And its goal is to hinder us, is to prevent us from moving forward. So no fear. Amen. Uh, with, this, with this being said, uh, I'm reminded of the four lepers in 2 Kings chapter 7, uh, verse 3 to 6. Uh, uh, at that time uh, in Samaria, uh, there was famine in the region. And plus, there was the enemy surrounded the place with uh, armed forces. So many things were happening. So there was a lot of fear going on. 
and no good exchange were taking place at that time. So these four lepers, they refused to be paralyzed by fear. Amen. And on top of, uh, they refused to be paralyzed by fear on top of the predicament they were in. But I like the positive story they told themselves. They said, if we go in the city, we're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to die because th there's already famine in the city. If we go in, they're going to kill us. But if we stay here, we won't have food to eat. We're going to die anyway. So what they do, they refuse for fear to paralyze them. And they, they, they went ahead and moved forward and, and started to make, you know, make movement toward uh, the city. And guess what? Little did they know that the enemy ran off. The enemy, you know, God caused the enemy to hear multiple steps or a big army coming against them, and they ran off and left the goods behind. Amen? So guess what? The enemy, the enemy was defeated just like that. You know, I don't know if the, those four lepers, they, they, knew, uh, they knew that God was going to protect them. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But they knew that God was going to come through to them. So God, the, God was their light and their salvation. They had fear of the unknown. They didn't know what was going to happen. There was darkness ahead. And I like uh, what uh, Pastor Bob said last week, when the bottom drops out. Amen. When there is darkness, there is fear on the, of the unknown. God is going to show up. And what did God do? God came through to them. He caused the enemy to hear something that wasn't there, and God won the victory for them. Amen. So what was standing between them, uh, their what was standing between uh, what they know about God and their victory was fear. And all they had to do is to kick that fear out, and they got their victory. They got what they needed. Amen. And they, that battle was won like that. Amen. So my encouragement for you this morning is don't allow yourself to be a slave to anything. Amen. But give God the permission to be your light and salvation. Therefore, no fear. Amen. You know, when you sense fear, that's not the time to start quoting scriptures and say, you know, this is, you know, Second uh, Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but this, you know, he has given me the spirit of love, power of a son mind. That's not the time to start quoting scripture. When you sense fear, that's the time you need to talk to it and say, fear, you're not from God. I'm not taking it. You might knock at the door, but that doesn't mean you're going to come in. Amen? It's just like, you know, you don't have control over anybody, you know, in your neighborhood knocking at your door. You don't have control over that. But what you have control over is whoever is going to come in. Amen? So, yeah, you might knock at the door, but that doesn't mean you're going to come in. Talk to it. Don't stop quoting scripture. Talk to it and say, fear, you're not from God, and I'm not going to allow you to come in here. Amen? So that's what we have to do. I don't know if you know uh, Smith Wigglesworth. He was a preacher in the 1800s. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, reading one of his uh, faith books, or I heard somebody said it. I haven't read too many of his books. I only went halfway on one of his books. And he said one morning he woke up, and he sensed an evil presence in the room. You know, he just, when he sensed that presence, he knew it was the devil who showed up. So he turned and looked and said, oh, it's just you. And then he turned the other side and started and went back to sleep. Amen. So it takes practice to do that. You, you know, everybody, everybody will be doing it if it is that easy. But it takes practice to do that. So he just said, oh, it's just you. Turn around and went back to bed. Amen. So no fear. It takes practice to do that. Amen. So God has not given us fear. And when you sense fear, you talk to it and say, no, you're not coming in. Amen. You're not from God and I'm not taking it. Amen. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Amen. So that's our encouragement for you this morning. We know God is our light and our salvation. Therefore, no fear. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We, don't, we are not afraid of any danger. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. I hope that helped you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you ready to give this morning? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are happy givers. We don't get tired of doing good because in due time, 
we're going to get a good harvest. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So you have your envelopes in the back of your seat, uh, uh, or you can text your giving to the number on the screen for you, or you can just mail your check. We will appreciate all that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to read Malachi chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to read it from verse 11. But verse 10 talks about bring your tithes and your offering into the storehouse. But I want to begin in verse 11, uh, just to kind of give you a little background. Uh, Malachi 3.11, it says, then, let's just read it from 10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me in, in this, says the Lord of hosts. If, and uh, say the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out so great of a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. Verse 11, then I will rebuke the devourer, insects, plague for your sake, and he, and he will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor will your vine in the field drop its graves before harvest, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. So that's what God has promised to us. You see, the thing is, God is interested in our finances to protect it and to multiply it. But, and when we give him, when we give to the kingdom of God, we are giving him a legal right to get involved in our finances, to intervene in our finances. Amen? Uh, we are familiar with the, the, the story in the Bible with the, the boy with the five loaves and two fish. You know, he was the, you know, he, when he gave what he had, he qualified to have what he, he qualified to have what he gave multiplied. He's the only one who got his loaves and fish multiplied at that place. The Bible doesn't talk about anybody else, uh, whatever anybody else, if anybody else there got their stuff multiplied, only him was that when whatever he gave, God multiplied what he had. Amen. So he was the only one that we know of, the Bible said. So when we give, we can say that we give God the legal right to intervene on our behalf. Amen. So we don't, you know, we don't know what the boy needed that time. Maybe that's what he needed. He just needed more food. So whatever you need this morning, you know, God is, when you give a God a way into our finances, He's going to meet the needs that we have. Amen. So this morning, I'm not going to talk too much. So this morning, uh, give the best that you have. Amen. Give God a way into your finances, and he will not disappoint you. Amen. What did he say he's going to do? He's going to rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Amen. What he promised he will do. Whatever you set your hands on is going to prosper. Amen. That's his promise to us, and God never disappoints. Amen. You know, God knows what we need, you know. God always has a way to, to, you know, things might be tight right now, but God always has a way to provide for us when we need him. Amen? Amen. So if you are ready this morning, uh, let's lift up our offering. And we are giving God way into our finances, amen, and he's going to intervene on our behalf. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. So let's lift up our offering and say this together. Hallelujah. We have a, an apprentice there, so it's all right. <laughs> all right. Let's say it together. As I tithe and give offerings, I am believing the Lord for souls and more souls, 100-fold return, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, Rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, royalties, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills decrease, bills paid off, Jubilee Church mortgage paid off, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for supplying all of my financial needs that I have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Welcome to Jubilee Church. We are transforming lives 
impacting our community so that we can live a better life. You've asked for it, so here it is. Make plans now to attend a pop blessing after the service on September 11th. Please bring your main dish and sides as in the past. Men, plan to attend a breakfast just for you on Saturday, September 17th at 9 a.m. Don't pass up this chance to fellowship with other men in the church. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer to register. Jubilee Church will be sharing the love of God to children around the world again this year through the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Program. Since 2008, we have sent hundreds of boxes to several countries. School supplies are great items to put in our boxes. Remember, everything has to fit in a shoebox. A list of acceptable items to be sent will be at the Connection Center in the foyer. Bring your items by no later than November the 9th. If you have questions about a Daily Dose episode or anything else, email them to media at jubileechurchomaha.com or leave them in the comments for your Daily Dose. Tomorrow, Pastor Anthony will provide a biblical answer to a question that was recently asked. These segments will air occasionally in place of your daily dose. Thanks for joining us today. Our salvation, hallelujah.
with you, God. Could we sing that part again uh, on Christ alone? Uh-huh. Christ That's so- Glory be to God. I want you to pay attention to that first line of, that, of, of this verse. It says, no power of hell or scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Which means you are in good hands. Amen. 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 Have you ever seen, I think it is the all state commercials that ask, are you in good hands? They took that from the Bible. In Christ alone, you are in good hands. And there is no power of hell because he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. And therefore, he gave you authority. He gave you a right to live triumphantly. And therefore, there is no power of hell that can ever come against you if you are in his hands. And there is no scheme that man can set against you that will ever succeed. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit who is the spirit of truth and knows all truth and will guide you into all truth and therefore there is nothing that man can ever set against you that can ever get you out of his hands. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I'm forever grateful that I have Jesus. And I'm forever grateful that he gave his life for me. And I'm forever grateful that I do not have to live my life any longer. I have to live his life. Glory be to God. And you and I have chosen to live the life of Christ. And as long as we live the life of Christ, guess what? No power of hell, no scheme of man will ever pluck us from his hands. Glory be to God. So, Father, we honor you this morning. We are forever grateful for your love. You have demonstrated it towards us through your Son. And now, Lord, we can stand boldly before your throne and declare that you are our Father. And this morning, we are forever grateful that, Lord, we will hear your voice and we continue to hear your voice. And, Lord, we can see your works. And, Lord Jehovah, you are allowing us, Lord, to continue to grow day by day in the spiritual realm. And we give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So good to see each and every one of you. The greatest blessing we ever have is the blessing of believers. Which means when believers come together, there is tremendous power that is being released amongst us. And in other words, everyone is bringing their supply. You have a body. And in order for your body to function, every part of your body has to bring its supply. Your right hand has to bring its supply. Your left hand has to bring its supply. Your left leg has to bring its supply. The right leg has to bring its supply. Your organs have to bring its supply for that body to function effectively. And therefore, we also being members of the body of Christ, when we come together, everyone is bringing their supply. And therefore, we can say that the life of God is in me and the life of God is amongst us. Amen? Amen. And so turn around to the person who is next to you and tell them, I'm so glad you brought your supply this morning. 
and therefore we Glory be to God. It's always a blessing to see each and every one of you. And I thank God that you're full of life. And if you're not full of life, you can just begin to do something. Just begin to say what the Word of God says. Let the weak say, I am strong. You don't have to wait to be strong for you to say, I'm strong. You begin when you're weak because he says, let the weak say, I am strong. I thank God that I'm strong. Why am I thankful? Because I have the spirit of God inside of me. And if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells inside of you, that very same spirit will quicken your mortal body. In other words, it's a waiting for you to agree with it because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you think and speak according to the power that is at work in you. Amen. And I'm forever grateful that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Amen. Our eyes have been opened to see the light of the glorious gospel. Amen. Well, uh, I want to pass uh, Pastor Bob Yenden's gratitude towards you. He said, uh, thank you so very much for your hospitality. And thank you very much for uh, being able to <clears throat> be here when he was ministering this last Sunday. And so th he's also grateful for your generosity. And I thank God for Jubilee Church because we walk in love, we know how to heal the Holy Spirit, and we are able to flow along as the Spirit of God is flowing and working with us. Amen. So I just want to say thanks uh, to that. I want to relay that to you. And also as your pastor, I just want to say thank you for not giving up in your faith. Because there's quite a few people who are giving up on their faith these last days. But I'm thankful for the Jubilee Church family. We are not giving up on our faith. We are constantly hearing the word of God, meditating on the word of God, not forsaking the gathering of the brethren. We are calling and checking on one another. And that is what love is and what, that is what the family is all about. See, we are never called to live our own lives with Christ. We are called to live our lives with Christ collectively. And that's why he always insisted or he always uh, commanded that you, know, you have to walk in love towards one another. Why? Because he says when you walk in love towards one another, then the world will know. Yes. The world will know. So in other words, sometimes we want to run out and let the world know, yet we're not walking in love. <laughs> See, he made it so easy for us just walk in love towards one another and the world is watching. And therefore, thank you so much for not giving up on your faith. Turn to the person who is next to you and tell them, I'm so grateful you never gave up on your faith. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Amen. I'm never going to give up on you. You know, we go through temptation just like everybody else goes through temptation, right? See, I am anointed to pastor, but I'm not anointed to live as a pastor. And so whatever I preach and teach, I have to live. Because if I don't live it, I will never be true to you. Because I, I don't want to preach to you what I'm not living. Yeah. Like I've made the statement before, don't be misled thinking that I come from heaven on Sunday morning. <laughs> and then right after service, I go back. No, I live in the same community. I go to the same grocery stores you go to. The same restaurant you go to. I meet the same people you meet. And you know what? I have to exercise my faith and love towards them just as we exercise towards one another. Amen. And you know what? And I don't go out there working as a pastor. I go out there as a believer. But when I come to, before you, I'm your pastor. But once I walk out of this door, I don't go out there and tell people, you know what? I'm a pastor. You know what? I'm a pastor. No. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When I'm out over there, I am a child of God. Amen. When I get in here, I have a functionality. That means I have a function to be able to function in. And because you have given me the permission to be your pastor, you can call me anytime as your pastor and I'll respond as your pastor. And anybody who's never given me permission to be their pastor, I can never respond as a pastor. Because you have to give me permission. Yeah. Even Jesus, people had to give them permission yeah. to minister to them. And so, 
I'm forever grateful that we are not giving up on one another. Amen? Amen. Glory be to God. The other thing I want you to be thankful for is you never give up on your place at Jubilee Church. Do you know that you have a place? You have a place at Jubilee Church. Just like your natural body, every part has got a place. Your right arm has got a place in your body. Your eyes have got a place in your body. Your ears have got a place in your body. And so I'm so grateful and thankful that you've never given up on your place. Otherwise, Jubilee Church will never be whatever it is. And as each and, as each and every member continues to grow up, the body just keeps on getting better and better and better. Amen? We are where we are today because we are all functioning where we are functioning. So again, tell yourself, I'm thankful I've never given up on my place at Jubilee Church. Only Kuma said that. <laughs> he, he, he heard and he heard and said it. I'm thankful. <laughs> Everybody has to be thankful. I'm thankful that I've never given up on my place. Even though sometimes you may feel like you want to give up in your place. But never give up. Do you know that challenging thing you and I have is walking in love towards one another as believers? It is easier to walk in love towards non-believers Amen. because they don't know you. They don't know, <laughs> they don't know you. It is easier to walk in love. But when we know one another as believers, I see you week in and week out. We gather together. We fellowship together. We begin to see some sides I never saw before. <laughs> and we begin to hear some words we've never heard before. And we begin to see some things we've never seen before. And we are the ones who are supposed to walk in love towards one another. If I don't know you, it is easier to walk in love. Why? Because you're going to be gone in a matter of minutes. <laughs> but if I know you, we are here together. And therefore, I begin to see something like, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> and that's why we should never give up on our parts. Never give up on our parts. Because if you give up on your parts, the body will never be whatever it needs to be. Amen? Amen. And so I'm forever grateful for you. And I'm forever grateful for all the new members that we are having. God is constantly adding to us, and we are grateful for that. Now, if we are not grateful for what God is doing to us, God will never be able to add to us. We always have to be appreciative. I thank God whenever each and every chair is being filled up. See, God gave us this chair so that they could all be filled up. God gave us this building so that it can be utilized for his ministry. And I'm forever grateful for what God is doing amongst us. And so I thank God for that. Amen? Amen. And so somebody might ask, why are you saying all that? I'm saying all that to let you know you ought to be thankful. Amen. We ought to be grateful. Because if you're not grateful, even what you have, do you know, can be taken away from you? Yep. Yep. Remember the ten lepers that God, uh, that Jesus uh, told to go and show themselves to the priest, and one turned back and gave thanks? And Jesus says, well, there are not ten of you, and only one of you turn, returned back. What happened to this one? He was thankful. He was grateful. Amen. And so I'm forever grateful for that as well. Amen? Amen. Are you ready for the word this morning? Amen. Well, I thank God for that, and uh, I believe God, <laughs> yes, it's good. I think there is a series that God began to work in my heart this week, and it is not a one-time, I thought it was going to be a one-time message, but it's not going to be a one-time message, and so I believe that I'll begin it today, and I'll build up on it until the Holy Spirit tells me to stop, because this is very vital for us to be able to live as believers. And so I, I ask you to be able to, to stay tuned, take notes, and go back and listen to the message again because this is the key part for every believer. Amen? Amen. So let's open with a word of prayer and get into the word. Father, we honor you this morning. We are so grateful for your love. We are so grateful for your mercy. And for the Lord, we thank you that as we gather together, Christ is being exalted. As we gather together, Father Lord, you are transforming our lives. As we gather together, Lord, you renew our minds. Lord, you restore us, and God, you fill us with your presence. 
And your spirit fills us to overflowing. And Father, we are forever grateful that, Lord, we never come short of your love. We never come short of your life. And as we gather together, Lord, you do great and mighty things amongst us. For your word goes forth in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And our faith do not rely on man, but our faith relies upon you, O Father. And this morning we thank you, Holy Spirit. As you continue to unveil unto us and open our eyes to see the mystery that is in the gospel, we continue to give God the glory and the praise and the honor. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has been shed for us, that has given us the opportunity and the right to stand as the children of God and has given us the right to hear the voice of God and to be transformed. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And uh, the, uh, the message that God has given to me is actually living the resurrected life but I'm going to give it to you from a, def- a different angle. I'm going to give it to you from a different angle of a culture shift. If you're going to live the resurrected life, you have to shift your culture. Culture is simply how we do things. And then shifting is simply means moving from the way we do things. And every person has a culture. Every nation has a culture. And... Every environment has a culture, and every culture has got a language. And you've got to understand that in order for us to live the resurrected life, we have to be able to transition into the resurrected life. Because the moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, instantly you are changed. But you have to transition. If you do not transition, you'll never, ever live the resurrected life. There's a difference between change and transition. And we must learn to transition the life that we've been called. And therefore, I'm going to share with you today how we can live the resurrected life, but it's going to come from the viewpoint of cultural shift. Try and imagine you being amongst the disciples in the upper room. You've never spoken in tongues before. But you've been left instructions that you wait and you're going to be endued with power and then you're going to be my witnesses. And then all of a sudden you are faithful to gather together in one accord. They are praying, waiting for them to be endued with power from on, uh, from on high. And then all of a sudden things shift. We go from our normal way of living to a different way of living. All of a sudden now we begin to speak a language we've never spoken before. Try and imagine that. See, that was a change of culture. The way we do things, we don't speak like that, but now we have to speak like that. Why? Because there is something that has taken place that demands for us to transition. There is a change that has taken place, now we have to transition. When we transition, we means we accept what has taken place and we begin to live by it. Change simply means I acknowledge there is a difference, but transition means I acknowledge there is a difference and I'm flowing with it. Therefore, you can be changed and never be flowing with it. And so on that day, they began to speak in unknown tongues. All of them together. Try and imagine all of us here, we all, all of a sudden begin to speak a different language. You look at one another, it's like, what are you speaking? I don't know. What are you speaking? I don't know. Because the Bible says, whoever prays in unknown tongues speaks not unto man, but unto God. How be it in the spirit, he's speaking mysteries. In other words, you're speaking secrets that have been hid by God for you, not from you. So every one of them began to speak a, a secret that was inside of them, and they never knew this. And then all of a sudden, their environment began to change. There are those people who are around them and began to say, what does this mean? Why? Because there's a change that has taken place. All of a sudden, things are not the same anymore. What does this mean? So they began to fill in the blanks. We don't know what this means, but maybe these guys are drunk. These guys are drunk. Because we've never heard anything like this. And so what did they begin to say? But we are hearing them glorifying God in our own language, which means everyone began to hear them speaking a a word that glorifies God in their own language. 
But have you ever understood this? You can be in the midst of a place that God is working and you have no clue what he's doing unless you get yourself into it. The 120, something was happening in them, but all these 3,000 men who were there had no clue what was happening. They had to give permission for them to be able to understand what's going on. Peter had to stand up and Peter had to say, we are not drunk as you suppose. Now imagine, Peter has never preached a message in reference to what the prophets had prophesied before. All of a sudden, he begins to say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. All of a sudden, change is taking place. We have to transition in it. There is a cultural shift that is taking place, and we have to shift with it so that the culture can influence us and influence our environment. And until these 3,000 made this statement, tell us what we must do. And Peter told them, you must repent and be saved. And guess what? Immediately, 3,000 people were added unto the, the, the church that day. So you try to imagine what happened. All of a sudden, they were there going about their daily lives. The culture was the same. The language was the same. All of a sudden, the culture shifted. And they had to transition with it. Otherwise, their environment was going to stay the same. And that is how you and I as believers always have to transition in what God is doing so that our environment can change. Our environment will never change if we do not change. And unless we change and transition to the change that is taking place in our lives, we will never experience the resurrected life. Just like those disciples on that particular day. They experienced 3,000 people being added to them as a result of them transitioning on what was taking place. And you and I are able to do so. These are people who could not pray for an hour. Now, these are people who could pray until where they were was shaking. A culture shift. Living the resurrected life. This is not something that is too far away from us. It's very much present. We can experience the very same thing. But you know, the only way we'll experience it, we have to develop a hunger for it. Are you hungry to see the move of God? Are you hungry to see the power of God? Are you hungry to see people who are being oppressed and depressed living amongst us? If you're hungry enough, then you'll begin to see the move of God. If you're not hungry enough, we'll still live with them and life will be normal. But God never called us to live a normal life in our environment. He called us to change the environment so that whatever is normal in the environment becomes abnormal. Yeah. Becomes abnormal. And you and I have to develop that hunger. And so, like I've mentioned, it is only God who can bring people of all nationalities and walks of life and give them one language. And they flow together. Do you know how, many, how much challenging it is to bring people of all nationalities, different languages, and make them do one thing, the same thing? Do you know how challenging that is? Somebody speaks this language, they're from, live alone, even one country, like in the, the country that I was born and raised up in Kenya. There are over 42 tribes. Do you know how challenging it is to bring the country together to flow? They just had the election. They're still petitioning the election. Why? Because every tribe has got its place. They want this and they want that and they want this and they agree with this and they agree not with that. And so it is tough to bring the nation together. But only one person can do that. God did. He brought all the nations together under the same purpose. They say we are all glorifying God. We all have one purpose. And we are flowing with the same, same purpose. Why? Because we realize our personalities will divide us. But the purpose of God will unite us. Why? We were born with a purpose, but we have to develop our character. And therefore, as children of God, we've got to understand we come into the kingdom of God with personalities. But our personalities has to be submitted to the purpose of God. We have to do what God has called, and that's what he's called. They were in one accord, which means we're all in one agreement 
We are in here for the purpose of God. And therefore, we must understand that even though the power of God flows through you, it is not from you, it is from him. And without him being your savior, you will never be saved. But why did Jesus die for you? So that you don't live your life, you live his life. Why did he pay the penalty of sin? So that you no longer have to live under the dominion of sin and live the life of Christ. Why did he empower you? So that you're not moved by the powers of the world. And therefore, I want us to be able to begin to see how this transition takes place. You can go with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. See, we all understand and believe that Christ was raised from the dead. And if we all believe that Christ was raised from the dead, do you also believe that you are raised from the dead with him? Because we are always quick to say we've been crucified with Christ. We are quick to say that. We've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you are crucified together with him, and the Bible says that he was crucified, and he was raised up from the dead, and the life which he now lives, he lives unto God. Which means if you are crucified with him, you died with him. And when he was raised up from the dead, you were raised up together with him. Which means the life which is now living is the very same life you ought to be living right now. Amen. And so in Colossians 1 verses 12, it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Aren't you glad you don't need any man to qualify you? Amen. What will happen if a man has to qualify you to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light? We'll begin to bring so many guidelines and uh, qualifications and see how, uh, how many times did you pray this week? How many times did you show up? How many times did you do this? Well, you don't qualify this week. But thanks be to God, the Bible says, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Which means we as believers are called saints, and we as saints, we have an inheritance. And we take part in that inheritance as saints in the light. Which means we have to stay in the light as saints in order for us to enjoy the inheritance that we have. And then he goes on to say this. He has delivered us from the powers of darkness. He has delivered us from the powers of darkness. What does it mean to be delivered? To be set free, to be rescued. See, whenever there is danger or distress in the community, you will hear a sound of a vehicle. And that sound of a vehicle is going to rescue somebody. It could be a fire truck. It could be an ambulance or it could be a police officer. What are they doing? They are going to deliver somebody. Because of danger or distress. And so we are being told that he has delivered us or he has rescued us from danger and distress of the power of darkness. Which means darkness has got power and the power of darkness causes danger and distress to the people who are in the world. Which means you and I are no longer supposed to be experiencing danger and distress. You have been delivered from it. So he has delivered us from the powers of darkness. Aren't you glad he never just delivered you and left you there? How will it be if, let's say, there was something burning out there and the fire truck comes and they put off the fire and they say, they go away and they leave you like that. See, the moment they do that, there is somebody else who also shows up. American Red Cross or Salvation Army. Yep. We need to find a place for you to live. We need some clothing. We need some food. What are they doing? They do not just deliver you, but actually they are helping you transition and continue with your life. So when we were delivered from the powers of darkness, the Bible says we were conveyed into the kingdom of his son, which is the kingdom of love. Now here we begin to see that actually there are two kingdoms. 
There is a kingdom of darkness and there is a kingdom of the dear, dear son of his love. Now you've got to ask yourself, what is a kingdom? We'll get that into a little bit. Let's just finish this first. And he conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Which means without the shedding of the blood, there is no way you are going to be conveyed into the kingdom of his dear son. So we thank God for the blood. Amen? Amen. The blood does great and mighty things. And therefore the blood has already spoken for us to be able to live in the kingdom of his dear son. Let me read it to you from the NLT, then I begin to give you some definitions. The New Living Translation says this, Always thanking the Father, he has enabled us to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Which means you ask yourself, if I am a child of God, I ought to be living somewhere. And where is that? In the light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. So in other words, as a believer, I ought to always follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. That enables me to walk in the light. And therefore, he goes on to say this, For he has rescued us <clears throat> from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave us our sins. Which means we never had freedom when we're in the kingdom of darkness. But now that we're in the kingdom of his dear son, we have freedom. And that freedom has been given to us as a result of him shedding his blood. No wonder he says in Galatians 5 verses 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty or in the freedom wherewith Christ has set you free. In other words, hold your ground. Because if you do not hold your ground, guess what? The powers that are be in the, in the world or in the darkness are looking forward to getting you back in there. Amen. And therefore you ask yourself, what is a kingdom? A kingdom is a domain or a territory that has the influence of the king. So if a king has influence over a territory, that becomes his domain and therefore it's going to be called his kingdom. And therefore, the world has got a kingdom. And that kingdom has got a king. And the king that is in the, the king of the world is Satan. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Satan is the God of this world. That's why when he was tempting Jesus, he says, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world and their glory. You can never give a kingdom you have no influence over. You only give kingdoms, you only give kingdoms that you have influence over. So Satan understands he has the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus has rescued us from his domain and from his power, where there is distress and there is danger. And now we have freedom and do not have to be afraid anymore of the powers of darkness. And therefore, you've got to understand then that if a kingdom is a territory that has got a king and the king has got influence over that territory, then now a king always looks for other colonies. He wants to colonize other territories as well. And so when they find another territory, they send a subject to that territory and that subject has to be able to subject itself to the parent territory that they came from. So that that territory will act exactly like the territory that they've come from. The nation of Kenya was colonized by the British. If you go to Kenya, you'll find them drinking tea. That influence came from the British. And they'll tell you every time is tea time. You drink tea at 6 in the morning, you drink tea at 8 in the morning, you drink tea at 10 in the morning, you drink tea at noon, you drink tea at 4 in the evening, you drink tea at 6 in the evening, you drink tea before you go to bed. <laughs> Influence from the British. Why? They were duplicating what they have been sent to come and do. Likewise, we have also been sent. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And Jesus told his disciples that let it be on earth as it is in heaven, which means heaven is the parent territory 
and earth is being colonized with a heaven influence. And whoever is going to do that is going to be you and me who are going to colonize it. Which means you and I, as we are on earth, we need to be able to influence earth with the heavenlies. Exactly. If heaven is drinking tea at 8 in the morning, you ought to be drinking eight, tea at 8 in the morning on earth. Why? Because that is what the parent territory is doing. If heaven is saying, by his stripes we are healed, you ought to be saying, by his stripes you are healed. Why? Because we are colonizing earth with the influence that is in heaven. Anything that is apart from that means you are disobedient to the kingdom that has sent you. And so you and I, if you're going to experience the resurrected life, we have to do exactly what Jesus did. And if we do not do exactly what Jesus did, guess what? We won't be able to colonize the earth. And if you're not able to colonize the earth, guess what? The earth will colonize you. Look at it today. The church is almost being evangelized by the world. Look at it. We are coming from the world and we are influencing the church with the world. And now the, world, the church is conforming to the world. If you want to accept people, you have to do this. You have to say this, you have to say that. When did we lose our culture? Do you know that there's a culture in the church? Yeah. And that culture is not being developed by man. Jesus says he will build his church. Yeah. So he's the greatest culture and the influence of the church. And therefore, you and I, who are members of the body of Christ, should be able to pick up the culture of the church and begin to influence those who are around us with the culture that is in the church. The church should not change. And I thank God that Jubilee Church is not going to change. Because sometimes we think that in order for us to win people who are in the world, we have to become like the world. No. If you're going to win people in the world, you have to win them with Jesus. You don't win them with the world. I've never seen a fire truck coming with fire to put out fire. Amen. <laughs> That property is burning. Let's bring more fire. It's going to put off that fire. Maybe my fire is going to be greater than that. And probably we are going to be able to influence that fire and will submit to us. No. They come with something totally different. And we have to understand we are totally different. And because we are living in this world, we are not of this world. We have been rescued from the powers of darkness. Darkness has got no dominion over my life. Darkness has got no more influence over my life. And therefore, I do not submit to the influence of the world. And that is going to be a process. That's why it's called transformation. That is your lifelong and my lifelong way of living here on earth. Constantly conforming to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Constantly conforming to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do not conform... The powers of darkness will still have influence over us. Now, if we understand that we have actually been delivered, we've been bought out from the powers of darkness, and we've been brought into the kingdom of his dear son, we've been brought from one place, and we've been brought into another place. In other words, change has taken place. If I ask you to move from that chair and come and sit over here, change has taken place. But have you transitioned? Have you transitioned? You'll be sitting there and saying, okay, I don't feel comfortable over here. You know, people are now looking at me differently. And what's going on? You see, you are still going on with arguments in your head, yet you've been brought into a place you ought to be comfortable. There is freedom in this place that you've been brought into, but you're still like, I'm still comfortable over there. You are used to where you are. That's why we're being told not to be conformed into the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Which means if you're being changed, and now you've been brought to a place, begin to renew your mind with the word of God. And once you're renewed with the word of God, guess what? You begin the transition process. You'll find a lot of believers who will be quick to tell you what the word of God says, but you'll rarely see it in their lives. Why? Because they do not understand Colossians chapter 3. Let's get over there. Colossians chapter 3. We have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians chapter 3. 
verses 1 and verses 2 says this. If you then were raised with Christ, have you been raised with Christ? We agree that we've been crucified with him, right? Galatians 2.20, we understand that. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, if you've been raised together with him, what are you being told to do? Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. So now, what is your responsibility? As one who has been translated from the powers of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. What is your responsibility? Seek those things. Which means it is up to you to begin to find the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Which means now your thinking process should be the thinking process of the heavenlies. What has Christ done for me? What has Christ given to me? What is God doing in my life right now? What is God doing through me? I should constantly think about those things. If I do not think of those things, guess what? I have changed, but I have not transitioned. So you and I have a responsibility to seek those things. Doesn't the Bible say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you? But so many a times in the world, we look for things, right? And so when we are born again, we still look for things, but yet things have changed. Now we need to seek the kingdom first and then the things will be added to us. In the world... We seek for things first and then hoping that the more things we have will show what kind of dominionship we have. That's why you see someone has to have many vehicles in the world to prove who they are. I have dominion now. Because see how many, if I have 20 vehicles, it's like, who can really match me on that in the world? But in the kingdom of God, it's not that way. I don't need to have many vehicles or even a vehicle To be part of the kingdom. But being part of the kingdom will add that to me. So we need to have that mindset. If you're going to live the resurrected life, there has to be a cultural shift. And that cultural shift demands a shift in our thinking. And demands a shift in our language. And therefore he says, not only do you need to seek those things, but once you've sought them out and you've found them, what do you need to do? You need to set your mind on those things and not the things that are on the earth. Set your mind on those things. I usually see people who are doing construction work and they are mixing cement and then with whatever, the the concrete, they're mixing it together and they pour it out. If you walk on it, what happens? It's going to go down, right? But if you let it set... What is going to happen? You can struggle with that. You'll need a sledgehammer just to break it. That is the kind of mindset you need to have in the resurrected life. In order for someone to get you out of what Christ has given to you, they better come with a sledgehammer. And there is no way you're going to come with a sledgehammer and get me out of it. Why? Because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And if God be for me, who can dare be against me? I am so set in my mind of the resurrected life, and there is no way you're going to change it. That's the only way we are going to make it as believers. If you're not going to think that way, we are never going to make it as believers. We're never going to experience. We'll only be talking the talk and no life. But I'm thankful to God, and I say, God, I don't want to pastor a people who don't want to grow in the resurrected life. And I begin by myself and saying, I'm not going to live a mediocre life and always preaching the life of Christ. I'm going to preach the life of Christ. I'm going to live the life of Christ. And I'm going to influence you with the life of Christ. Because what you see and what you hear, this is it. Amen. You won't find me say, living a contrary life to what I'm preaching you. Amen. Because I only have one life. I don't have two lives. <laughs> In the world, we have more than one life. Did you know that? You have a public life and you have a private life. When you come privately, you have a different kind of life. Because in the world, that's what we do. When you go to the public, you have another life. In the kingdom of God, we only have one life. It is the life of Christ. So if I go in private, it's the life of Christ. If I go in public, it is the life of Christ. 
And because I live the same life, I can experience the life of Christ. And I take responsibility for that. Now, another translation says this. The, uh, the, the uh, Passion translation says, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits, enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. And what are people fighting for? Power, honor, and authority. So you're being told you've been brought to a place of power, a place of honor, and a place of authority. How much honor? All honor. How much power? All power. How much authority? All authority. So then why do you want to go look for something that is less than all that has been given to you? All authority and power has been given to me. And then now he delegated it to you. Now begin to think that way, live that way, and speak that way. So he say, yearn for those things. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the destructions of the natural realm. In other words, you are brought from a place of destruction into a place of focus. In the world, the, the kingdom of darkness, there's a lot of destruction. And the kingdom of his dear son, there is focus. But do you know that the moment you're brought into the kingdom of his dear son, you are still distracted? Yeah. Yeah. To my workplace, we use a centrifuge to spin specimens. And so you can set this centrifuge at a certain speed for a certain t amount of time. And that centrifuge will spin. And when that time is done, it will let you know that the time is done. But do you know you can still not open that centrifuge? Because it is still spinning. It has not come to a standstill. Likewise, when you're brought into the kingdom of heaven, your mind is still spinning with the destructions of the, of the earth. You know you are a child of God. It's like, but I'm still suffering. Did you see what's going on with me? Oh, poor me. Yeah, you're still spinning. Even though that was stopped. Jesus stopped it immediately. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you were translated from the powers of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son, but your mind is still spinning. I'm always sick. We're always sick. You don't know what happened to my grandpa. And you don't know what happened to my pa. And you don't know what's going to happen to me. Oh, we are just so much full of fear because fear has always been part of us. You never know. But we thank God. Mind is still spinning. Amen. Your job is to keep on seeking those things that are above. Find out where am I seated? What's going on over here? How much power do I have? How much authority do I have? How much honor do I have? I have it all. If I have it all, then I need to set my mind on that and say, you know what? I'm going to speak to my mind and I'm going to command you, stop spinning. Because now we begin to focus. The things that are above, where Christ is seated. All these other things are distractions. The message translation says it this way. So if you are serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ... Act like it. <laughs> Makes it simple. Act like it. Are you serious about the resurrection life? Act like it. In other words, find what Jesus did and just do it. You see, Nike did not find it first. Nike found it in the Bible. Whatever he tells you, just do it. That was Mary's slogan. Mary is the one who says, whatever he tells you, just do it. And Nike said, we like that slogan. Just do it. And now they try to give it to every athlete who is running or basketball or everything. And someone like, oh, I just want to do it just like they are doing. No, no, no. Do it just like Jesus said it. So it says, if you are serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. See things from his perspective. And therefore now we've got to understand then, if we are going to be able to live this resurrected life, we understand we have been translated from the powers of darkness or the kingdom of darkness. There's one domain we were under, the influence of the God of this world. But now we brought into another domain whose influence is the Son of God. And so the Son of God has got influence over our lives the moment we've accepted him as our Lord and our Savior. But did you ever understand if you do not give him permission, even though you're in his kingdom, you're never going to experience his life? Just because you're in his kingdom does not mean you're going to experience his life. 
I can testify of that. A few years ago, I got a job. And in that job, they told me there are benefits. So they told me that there is health benefits, there is retirement benefits. And so if you sign up for them, you become a partaker of the benefits. I was never employed in a job that had benefits before. So I still had the distractions of the environment where there are no benefits. So I ask myself, who needs insurance benefits? Because if you're going to see the doctor, you'll just pay cash. Because that's the environment I lived in. So the distractions that are ahead of, uh, in front of me. So guess what? I never signed up for the benefits. They said, if you give a certain percentage of your money, we will match it up. Say, so who needs retirement money? Because I know when I retire, they'll give me a golden handshake. Give you a watch or something good, thanking you for whatever you, you work. Like, that is the environment I was in. So you come into another environment. I'm in this environment. I have a right to benefits, but I'm not partaking of them. You know how long it took me to sign up for them? Three years. My mind was not set into the kingdom where I was. I was still being distracted by the things that were around where I was delivered from. So I missed three years of insurance, no checkup, no doctor's visit. Why, who needs to go? You go for a doctor's visit. I missed three years of uh, free money because my employer was going to match up whatever I put in there. Who needs that? See, wrong mindset but yet have been brought out of that. So I wasn't experiencing that. Just because you are in Christ does not mean you're going to experience the life of Christ. Amen. And some of us may go for years and never experience it at all. Some of, some of us may go for a certain amount of time, then they begin to experience it. How do you know you're experiencing it? When you begin to go, wow, have you ever seen this in the Bible? <laughs> now it means you've begun to set your mind on the things where Christ has already given to you. And so we have to be able to be serious about that, which means now we are beginning to assimilate. To assimilate means you're learning the language and you're learning the culture. Now, in the kingdom of God, there is a language and there is a culture. The kingdom of the world, there is a language and there is a culture. Let's begin by looking at what language you are speaking when you are in the kingdom of darkness. Turn with me to uh, first. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verses 13. We're going to look at the language that the world has. And why am I showing you this? So that you can get away from it. Amen. You are delivered from that. And you need to begin to learn a new language. In 1 John chapter 3 verses 13 it says this. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. What does the word marvel mean? Wonder. So in other words, when you are in the world, it is normal. Hate is normal. Hate simply means love less or dislike. So in the world, the language they speak, we dislike you, we love you less, we don't care about you. That's how people live in the world. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. People dislike you. People fight and compete amongst one another. But Jesus brought you out of that. Now he's telling you, do not wonder, my brethren. He's talking to believers, not non-believers. He's talking to believers. He said, do not wonder if the world hates you. Which means he gave you something that will make the world dislike you. And so don't try to be a friend to the world. <laughs> because if you go back to the world, you're going back to hatred. So you've been brought out of hatred. And so Jesus is saying one of the languages you need to learn is the language of love, not the language of hate. So in other words, we as believers, we need to love one another. I don't love you less and I will not dislike you. Why will believers hate another believer? There is a verse for that I'm going to share with you. In the world, people dislike you because of your color. In the kingdom, we don't dislike you because of your color. 
That's why you're finding that there is racism. Why is there racism? Racism. In the world, in the kingdom of God, we've all been made one. So you see, when we move into the kingdom of God, my mind could still be like, you are white and I'm black. So, yeah, you're white and I'm black. So what's the, what's, what's the problem with that? <laughs> right? Are you black? No. <laughs> so what's the problem? Yeah. See, in the kingdom of God, there's no problem. We've been made one with Christ. And so skin doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter because we are one in Christ. But if you don't get your mind into that, you're still going to go like, you know, the white people and the black people. Is there a white Christ and a black Christ? <laughs> Is there a white kingdom of heaven and a black kingdom of heaven? Oh, it's all one kingdom. <laughs> she said hell is black. <laughs> black heaven. In other words, there's a lot of fire in there. There's a lot of soot. It's dark in there. <laughs> but you see, you will never experience the resurrected life if you're going to think that way. Why would, some, why would I dislike you because of your skin color? Why would I dislike you because of your gender? Oh, I'm a man. You better listen to me because I am the man. <laughs> then the Bible says, he says, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. Then he did not say, let him have dominion. Did he say let him? No. What did he say? Let them. let them, male and female, have what? So then why should I be able to dislike you because of my gender? Amen. You see, we have to renew our minds to this or we'll never experience the resurrected life. Amen. In the world, that is there. That's why you're being told, do not wonder if the world dislikes you. Because the world will see you and say, how come you're speaking with her? Yeah. And you can even go for lunch with her. And you can even do activities with her. Yeah. So Yeah. That's not what's happening in the world. I'm not of this world. You have forgotten that. And let me let you know, I've been delivered from the powers of the world and been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And therefore, right now, I'm just showing you what the kingdom of heaven looks like. As a matter of fact, I've never looked at her skin to see if we are different. I look at her heart. Paul says we no longer look at men as men. We know them by their spirit. Because this flesh is going to stay here on the ground. Amen. When I get to heaven, you're going to wonder, what were you fighting about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And so he's saying, do not marvel if the world hates you. So don't try to be fitting into the world. You need to be able to stand out in the world. And if you don't have that settled around in your mind, the kingdom of darkness will have control over you. You see how they're looking at you? See, your boss is white and you're black. They don't give you opportunities because you are black. Did you see they gave it to the other person because they are white? <laughs> your mind begins to go in that area. And then a white person will say, you know, they are black. And because they are black, that's why they are running as fast as they are running. We can never run like that. <laughs> See, you're bringing the world into the kingdom of his dear son. No, you're supposed to colonize the world. And therefore you're told, do not marvel. That is the language of the world. If you don't understand that, you can be in Christ and still speaking the language of the world. How about John chapter 17? John chapter 17 and verses 14. Begin to see the things that are actually distinguishing us to be able to live the resurrected life. Which means there's a cultural shift, right? And we have to transition in it. We've changed, but we have not transitioned. Jesus is saying, he was praying for his disciples, and say, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Now what is going to make the world hate you? The word. Quit speaking the word, the world will love you. So you've got to understand, if I'm going to live the resurrected life, what should be my language? The word of God. 
Because Jesus says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Why? The world does not speak the language of the word of God. The world speaks a different language. It is not of the word of God. The world will tell you that, you know what? You can be any gender you want, depending on what you feel. But the word says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I was placed in my mother's womb, God knew me. Not when I was in my mother's womb. Before I was placed in my mother's womb, God knew me. Why? He chose me in himself before the foundations of the world. That is the language of the word. And the world will hate you for that. And you need to know that and be comfortable. Because I don't want to win the love of the world. It's only Jesus who can win them through me. And so I won't let the world evangelize me. I will evangelize the world with the word. Amen. So he's saying, I've given them your word because I'm not of the world. In other words, Jesus is saying, the world didn't love me. Yes. And I have a kingdom and my kingdom rules and reigns forever. And I've brought you into my kingdom and this is how I overcome and this is how you're going to overcome. Amen. This is how I spoke and this is how you're going to speak. Amen. Which means you cannot be in the kingdom of God and try to speak like the world and get the benefits of the world. Have you ever tried to call a different bank that you're not saving your money in and tell them you want them to, to, you want to withdraw some money? <laughs> Maybe you are banking with First National Bank and you're calling American National Bank and saying, I would like to, to make a withdrawal. You can never get the benefits of American National Bank if you're not with American National Bank. You are either in the kingdom of God or you are either in the kingdom of darkness. Amen. And if you're in the kingdom of God, you better renew your mind and live according to the kingdom of God. Amen. So that you can receive the benefits of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? And therefore, we have to understand our minds have to be renewed. We have to keep ourselves into this mindset. Why? Because if we don't keep ourselves into this mindset, guess what? We will never transition into the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's go to John chapter 3, verses 19 and verses 20. No, this is not a shouting service, but it is okay. We should be shouting in this. Because if you're going to be rooted and grounded, and you want to see your life different, and you want to see God working in your life, you need to know these things. Because the biggest thing is you can shout and jump. But then after you're shouting and jumping, do you have a solid ground that you can rest on? If you don't have a solid ground on resting on, then you're just standing on a sinking sand. John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Jesus is saying, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. What is the condemnation of the, light, the judgment? Men loved darkness rather than light. Amen. Where were we translated from? Darkness. All right, so we were translated from darkness. So Jesus is saying judgment came because I am the light. And when I came into the world, I brought judgment, but men loved darkness rather than light. We have understood that darkness has got what? Hatred. They love less and they dislike. Yep. But Jesus is saying, in the world, they love people less and they dislike them. Because what? They don't like light. Yep. And then he goes on to say this, because their deeds were evil. In other words, their actions were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So in other words, whoever keeps on practicing evil, or whoever keeps on walking in hatred, is afraid of the reality of Christ being exposed in them. Amen. That's what he's saying over here. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The world does not want their deeds to be exposed. You understand that? Everything is being done under the chair. Everything is being swept away. We don't want anybody to know everything is being done hush, 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 hush. All of a sudden you realize, oh, this law has been passed. All of a sudden you realize, this was already set into place. How? Their deeds are evil. And they hate the light. That's why they'll hate you because you have the word of God. And the Bible says that the entrance of his word gives you light. And therefore now you are enlightened. You're no longer doing things hush, hush. You're no longer walking in darkness. You're walking in light. And therefore you can stand and they hate you because you're exposing their deeds. 
That's why you need to be so full of the life of God. You go to your workplace and you become a whistleblower. How do you become a whistleblower? You speak the truth, which is the word of God. You stand for the truth, which is the word of God. You live in the truth, which is the word of God. They will hate you, absolutely. But don't worry, they hated Jesus, but he made it. You are going to make it. Because the power of light is greater than the power of darkness. Have you ever heard of intensity of darkness? No, there's no intensity of darkness. But have you ever heard of intensity in light? Which means light is not static. So the more you walk in light, the more brighter and brighter and brighter things get. The less you walk in light, the less light you see. Which means if you continue to walk in the word of God, speak the word of God, guess what? Your environment will continue to be enlightened. And there will be greater light and greater light and greater light until your environment turns into light. Amen. You refuse to speak the word, you are contributing to the darkness that is in the community. You speak the word, you are contributing for your community being full of light. And therefore, we need to have people who are so full of the word of God. Everywhere they go, they speak the word of God. Why? Because in darkness, there is a language. And that language is a language of hatred. And hatred is like, we don't love light. We don't like it because it exposes our deeds. But in the kingdom of God, we love the word. Why? Because the Bible says that the word of God exposes the intentions of our hearts. Where we have a pure conscience before God and before men. I don't do anything in darkness. That's why the Bible says that the, the God gives his word to the simple. He gives understanding to those who love his word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. No wonder he said that his word is a lamp unto my feet. He's even helping us. When you begin to speak the word, it becomes a lamp unto our feet. In other words, I will never stumble in darkness because the word of God is my, as a lamp unto my feet. In other words, before I begin to do anything, what does the word of God say about this? And when I begin to speak the word of God, guess what? Uh -uh, I'm not going there. I can see an evil scheme over there. So this is the language of the world. This is what you've been brought out of. And you know what? You may have been doing things hush-hush. When you come into the kingdom of God, you still want to do things hush-hush. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We're not judging you. You are in the right place. The word of God will be able to expose all those things. And all of a sudden, you'll say, like the way, uh, who was this? Zacchaeus said, when Jesus said, today salvation has come into your house. Jesus did not condemn him. Other people were calling him, you are a tax collector. How can you go and eat with a tax collector? This guy is a sinful man. The world is condemning you, condemning you, condemning you. The light shows up. And when the light shows up, it brings conviction into you and says, if I've ever taken anything from any man, I'm going to give it back four times. No condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? The word is exposing the intentions of your heart. That is not what I meant. If that is what it did, I'm going to give it back. Why? Because I have all power. I have all authority. I have all honors from God. Why should I take something from the world that does not belong to me? Amen. That is the language of the world. I'm now speaking the language of the heavenlies. I'm living the resurrected life. Yes. There is a cultural shift. How I do things. I never used to do things that way. Before I was born again, I used to steal. Did you know that? <laughs> used to steal candy when I go to a grocery store. That blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I tell you, you think I came from heaven today and I'm going back to heaven. No. The world had an influence over me. When they sent me to the grocery store, I'll look at those candy. When the shopkeeper is not looking, I'll take two or three extra. <laughs> Put in my pocket. See, that was the language of the world. Now, I don't do that. Why? There's a cultural shift that has taken place in my life. I used to lie. The world, I used to lie. I remember I, I conned my friend of 500 Kenyan shillings. <laughs> I told him I could give him the best camera ever he's looking for. And 500 shillings is a lot of money back then, even now. And so my friend put his trust in me. He was a believer, but I wasn't. <laughs> He's the one who preached, actually, he's the one who prayed me into the kingdom of God. But I conned him. He's now a pastor in California. <laughs> so I took his 500 shillings. 
never gave him the camera. Like, where is the camera? You know what? The guy never delivered it. He's, next time we go, I'm going to bring it to you. One month. Where's my camera? The guy hasn't shown up yet. See, in the world, we don't want to come to the light because our deeds are going to be exposed. But in the light, every time he showed up, I have to always come up with another story because I don't want my deeds to be exposed. So every time I keep on hiding, every time I keep on hiding, every time I keep on hiding, guess what? When I was born again, that was no more. Amen. No more. I don't con people anymore with your money. Because I know that the Bible says gold and silver belongs to who? I have it all. So why do I need to con you of your $2, $5, $10, $10,000? Uh, $10, why do I need to do that? My father owns it all, and I have access to it. But you know, some of us still have that mindset of the world. That's why we can never live the resurrected life. We can never walk into full uh, divine health and healing. We can never walk in full divine provision and protection. Why? We still have the world way of like, you know what, I have to keep this and I have to keep that so that I can have this. No, no, no. Jesus says you have it all. Let that go. First John chapter 2. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Anybody learning anything from this? Amen. If you're going to live the resurrected life, you have to let that life go. We are starting with the language of the world. Then you're going to get into the language of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. So we are seeing how the language of the world is. Now sometimes you need to know what is so that you don't do it. Amen. Because sometimes we think it is still no- normal. You'll hear people say, uh, right now we just do white elephant lies. When are we going to have the black elephant lies? <laughs> when are we going to get to the white rhino lies? <laughs> <Not a whopper. laughs> a lie is a lie, right? Exactly. And when you get into the kingdom of God, you need to renew your mind. Live that kind of life. I've been translated. I've been removed from that kingdom, that domain, that influence. Has got no power or authority over me anymore. I am under a different dominion. And that dominion requires me to seek what is of Christ and keep my mind there and keep on living there by speaking the word of God. Amen. First John chapter 2 says this. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. This is talking to believers, not non-believers. So if you're a believer... And you hate your brother. Hate simply means love them less or dislike them. You are still in darkness until now. Even though you've been brought into light, you are still in darkness. Why? Because you hate your brother or you hate your sister. Now you're going quiet on me. (laughs) That's why I was saying that you can be in the kingdom but never experience the kingdom. He says... He who says is in the light, and we are all in the light, right? And hates his brother or sister is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. In other words, I love you unconditionally. I know some of you now are thinking, but I don't trust them. The Bible does not say love and trust. It says love them unconditionally. Do you know that Jesus loves everybody but does not trust everybody? Amen. Do you know that? Amen. And so take the trust out and go with love. I love you unconditionally, but as a matter of trust, you have to prove your trust. You have to earn your trust. So he says, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Which means, do you want to live a life free of stumbling? Yeah. Walk in love towards your brethren. Quit trying to please the world. They hate you already because you're in the light. Amen. They hate you already because you're in the light. The only way you're going to win their love back is you stop, stop speaking the word and live like they live. Yeah. But as long as you're in the kingdom of God, speak the word, stay in, the lo- stay in love, love your brothers and sisters unconditionally. Regardless of what you do or say. Because the love that I love you with is not because of what you've done. It's because of what Jesus did. Jesus says, love your brethren as I have loved you. So in other words, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, I love you unconditionally. You are an agent on earth influencing or colonizing the earth. How are you supposed to do that? Love them unconditionally. You remember the British influenced Kenya with tea? 
They drink tea at 8. What do we drink? What do we do at 8 o'clock? We drink tea at 8 o'clock. They drink tea at 10 o'clock. What do we do? We drink tea at 10 o'clock. So Jesus says, I love you unconditionally. You turn to your sister and say, I love you unconditionally. But I'm so sorry on whatever I did. I forgive you because the Bible says if they ask you for forgiveness, forgive them and continue. They, come, they keep on doing that same thing even 900 times. Forgive them unconditionally. The world will only forgive you once. Second is a different story. Amen. Goes on to say this. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. Which means you are walking in hatred and you are walking in dislike and you are walking in less love than you ought to walk in and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now let me ask you a question. Who's blinded your eyes? See, Satan is the God of this world blinding the minds of many so that they do not see the light of the glorious gospel. Jesus has brought you into the kingdom of light so that you can see and know what to do. But when you choose to go out of the kingdom of light and go into the kingdom of darkness, you are allowing him to blind your eyes so now you don't know what you're doing. If you find a believer who does not know what they're doing, you ask yourself, are you walking in love? Because if you walk in love, he is telling us, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. The word is not a lamp unto your feet, neither is it a light unto your path. Amen. You have not been enlightened in the eyes of your understanding. You do not know the truth to set you free. Why? Because I'm still holding something against him. Why am I holding something against him? Because he told me he was going to be there and he wasn't there now. I don't like him as I used to like him. You see, dislike. I hate you. That is hatred. Hatred is you, you, you like less. You love less. You dislike. I dislike you because you never show up. Now let me help you as believers. Always make room for mistakes yeah. with our fellow brothers. Yeah. We are a work in progress. Amen. Philippians 2.13. God is at work in you, both to will and to do for his own good pleasure. Who is at work in you? God is at work in you. And therefore, if you miss it, what should I do? Bear with you. Say, it's okay. It's okay. We are walking in love. But if we are only believers of one chances, <laughs> then we'll begin to stumble. We'll begin to have issues. Why? Because we are not walking in love towards one another. Next week I'll share with you the language of heaven and how you can develop the language of heaven. I'm just sharing with you now the language of the kingdom of darkness. It is hatred. I've just shown you things. The world will hate you. A lot of times people say, you know, what are we going to do in the world today? Nothing. Let your light so shine before them. Speak the word of God, but I don't want to offend anybody. It is up to them. They are the ones who are being offended. Your part is not to offend them. You don't find in the scriptures where it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might offend the people in the world. <laughs> no, that he might set them free. But they choose to be offended. Why? Because he has told us in the book of John chapter 3, they love darkness. That's why they don't want to be in light. But I'm the light of the world that whoever follows me will never be in darkness. And therefore, he came to set the world free, but because the world loves darkness, they don't want light, and therefore they keep on stumbling, and he's saying, it is not my problem. Therefore, don't take the world's problem upon yourself. Let the world carry their own weight. You walk in your own freedom. Amen. Amen. Some of you need to be set free on that. Yeah. You carry the weight of the world. Oh, my co-workers don't like me anymore because I did not do whatever they asked me to do. So what? Do you know what happened to Jesus? He fed over 5,000 men. These guys followed him the following day. They said, we've been looking for you. We know you are the man of God or the son of God. Tell us what we must do in order for us to get in the kingdom of God. You'll think that, man, these guys are following me. They are great, right? Jesus tell them, okay, you want to follow me? So oh, yeah. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Do you know what happened? They said, this is a hard saying, and they left him, and they all walked away. How about if you carried all that weight and say, oh, Father, what did I do? How can I win them back? I never meant to say that. I never meant to offend you. No. He stood there and told his disciples, are you not going to go too? <laughs> but his disciples were enlightened. They said, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
In other words, I have experienced your light. And I want to walk in that life. And I want to live in that life. I'm not going to go back into the world where there's hatred and there is uh, dislikes and there is all this commotion going on and destruction. I want to stay focused to live the eternal life. Glory be to God. Amen. And I believe, God, that that is who we are. At Jubilee Church, we are going to live the resurrected life. Amen? There is a cultural shift that is taking place in our lives. Our minds are being renewed. We are being transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. We are never the same. Everywhere we go, we are influencing our lives. And next week, you'll see when I'll be able to show you. When you begin to walk in the language of the kingdom of light, your environment actually obeys you. So you either influence your environment or your environment influences you. And I'm going to show you, you're going to see it in scriptures, how people who are walking in love, how their environment is automatically influenced by them. And those who refuse, that environment influences them. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you this morning. And we are so grateful for your loving kindness and your mercy. Father, we thank you that there is a cultural shift taking place in our lives. And Lord, we are not only talking about the resurrected life of Christ, but Lord, actually we are experiencing the resurrection life of Christ. Thank you that, Lord, our minds are being renewed day in and day out by your word. The Holy Spirit is putting us into remembrance. And Lord Jehovah, we thank you that we love your word and we love one another. You have connected us together by your spirit. You have brought us together with your spirit. And Lord, we fellowship together with one another in love in the name of Jesus. So now, Lord, we defy every powers of darkness. We resist every powers of darkness as we stand fast in faith. Lord, we give you glory and we give you praise. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I am thankful for the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has brought me into your family. And I have discovered I have brothers and sisters into your family, brought together with the blood of Jesus and your love. And you've shared your love abroad in my heart by your spirit. Your spirit strengthens me, breathes upon me, puts me into remembrance, and guides me into all truth. This morning, I renew my mind to your word. I belong into your kingdom. I am a child of light. I walk in light. I speak light. I live light. In Jesus' name. I speak to my body. You have to line up with the word of God. I speak to my mind. You be renewed as I meditate. On the word of God, I speak to every form of sickness, any form of disease that might be upon this body. I command you, in Jesus' name, leave this body. In Jesus' name, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, There is freedom. freedom. I have freedom freedom. in divine health and healing. healing. My mind is a lot. I am free free from oppression oppression and depression. depression. I take authority authority over every form form of anxiety. anxiety. And I think of of what is true, what is is noble, noble, what is praiseworthy. What brings God glory? And my mind has peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to your name. Father, we honor you this morning. We honor you this morning. As your children, Lord, we are partakers of your divine nature. The very nature of Christ is in us. Lord, we live in this nature. 
We experience this nature. We carry it with us everywhere we go. And our minds are renewed. Our lives are transformed. Our families are transformed. Our families are restored. Our communities are transformed in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father Lord, we thank you for the influence of your power. And the influence of your presence. And everywhere we go, Jesus Christ is being exalted. And Father Lord, I take authority over every spirit of intimidation. I break its power over our lives. And I declare we do not have the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And therefore, we choose to start up the gift of God that is within us. And fight the good faith, fight the good fight of faith as we lay hold of eternal life. Amen. I pray over every individual as I apply the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our minds, over our health, over our finances, and over our families. And I declare that, Lord, any weapon formed against us shall not prosper. Any tongue reason against us in judgment will not prevail. We have a heritage as the children of God. And I declare that the blood of Jesus has been applied. And the blood of Jesus continues to speak better things on our behalf. And we, te and we testify of the blood that, Lord, we shall live and not die. But we shall fulfill the number of our days on earth in Jesus' name. I take authority over every lie of the devil. I take authority over every plans and schemes of the devil. You have no right over our bodies in Jesus' name. You have no right over our future in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus has connected us with our future. Now I declare we are blessed indeed of the Lord. Any tongue risen against us in judgment will not prevail. We condemn those tongues in Jesus' name. Father, we bless you and we honor you. Now because we are blessed, we shall be a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so very much for allowing me to speak to you and allowing God to minister to you. I'd like to encourage you, let this not be the last time you're hearing this message. Hear it over and over and over. Tuesday, join in prayer. There's something important about us praying. Wednesday, let's join together in Bible study. We have to continue building ourselves up and continue to grow in what God has called us to grow. Amen? Amen. If you're not able to join us during the week, I'm looking forward to seeing you again on Sunday. Have a wonderful rest of your week and stay blessed.